Well, good morning, everybody. Glad to see you. I feel a little harried. We, uh, we got a call Thursday night, and we've been trying to get into this house we've been building. And the guy, this is 9 o'clock Thursday night. He said, hey, we got it worked out. You can move into your house tomorrow. What? Tomorrow? Okay, because we'd expect it about another week or so. So if I look harried and sound harried, and we've been moving the last two days. Uh, it's been fun. And I appreciate the cooler weather uh, to, to make a move a little easier. It, was, it, it, uh, it, did, it dropped down to 98 after about 6 o'clock, so it was good. It's all good. We're in Acts. Acts, we're, we're starting in chapter 13, but we're starting in chapter 13 from chapter 12, verse 25. That's where we'll go. Preston, good to see you, man. How you doing? All right. You look better. Acts chapter uh, 12 is where we'll start at verse 25. I will read the first four verses or so because I, I don't want to give anybody an assignment to read. It's got a bunch of names. So you can struggle over pronouncing the names, uh, not that you necessarily would. But after that, after I read the first four, there's only one other passage we need to read for right now, and that's chapter four or chapter 13, verses 4 to 12. So who wants that one reading after me, 4 to 12? Anybody? I'm just going to jump in there and say, all right, Corey's going to do it. Uh, so I'll start out with uh, 1225, and Corey can pick it up at 13.4. Here we go. Acts chapter 12, verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had prayed, or fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. Went down to Selachia and sailed there, from there to Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elmas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching and the Lord, the teaching about the Lord. Thank you. All right. So who's traveling with Barnabas and Saul? John Mark. Remember who John Mark is? That's Barnabas's nephew. So Barnabas and his nephew are with Saul and they're traveling. And where do they wind up in chapter 13, verse 1? Antioch. How many Antiochs are there that we know of in those days? There were two. This one is in where? Do you remember? Antioch of Syria. This is Syria. Syria is a well-known Bible nation. The Arameans were the Syrians also. So if you're reading in your Old Testament, you read about the Arameans. They were the Syrians, same, same bunch. But this Antioch is in Syria. Think about that because the Arameans, the Syrians 
have consistently been the enemies of the Jews down through history, and boom, here we have the church established in Antioch of Syria, and this is the church that's going to send the Apostle Paul out on his missionary journeys. He's, he's leaving, that's what we just read about, Corey read it for us, leaving on the first missionary journey. And it says there in chapter 13, verse 1, there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers. And then he names some of those guys. And Saul is named among them. So they're ministering to the Lord in verse 2, and they're also fasting. Why? What's the purpose of fasting? Have we studied that enough? Okay. What do you think about when you're fasting? It, it's like a chain reaction. When you're fasting, you think about food. When you think about food, and here's the thing about fasting. You don't fast just to fast. You fast for a specific purpose. Something you're looking for of a spiritual nature, not a physical nature, but a spiritual nature. And when you fast, when you give up food, every time you have a hunger pang, or you, oh yeah, I'd like to have a sandwich, oh, that's why I'm fasting is for that spiritual, it just keeps bringing that point, that purpose before your eyes. So if you want to focus on something spiritual, fast for that purpose. And that fasting will constantly remind you of that spiritual purpose. And so they are fasting. They are spiritually minded. That's what fasting is all about, being spiritually minded. Uh, and you can't, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I say that all the time, don't I? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Who has ever fasted in order to lose weight? Like that. Okay. All right. But that's not the same thing. And you sure don't have the same motivation. It's really interesting to me. When I'm fasting for a spiritual purpose, it's really pretty easy. I know it might sound odd. Because fasting to lose weight is not easy. Do I hear any amens? From the congregation, that is not easy because it's like, who really cares what my waistline is uh, besides me? And I don't really care because I want a sandwich. That's kind of a, the, what happens when you're fasting for, for losing weight. But when you're fasting for a spiritual purpose, you've already set that spiritual purpose above. And when, you, when you're reminded of that spiritual purpose because of your hunger pangs, it makes you feel good. I'm committing myself to something good. Yeah. So that's, that's what they're doing. And I didn't mean to overfocus on that, but I just don't think we focus enough on that aspect of spirituality sometimes. And you can do it anytime you want. So, verse 2. Yes. Is this the same called Christians? Yes. This is that same place called Christians. In, in this town, first of all. Verse 2, who says he wants Barnabas and Saul to go on a particular work? The Holy Spirit says this. Has the Holy Spirit talked to anybody else before, given anybody else instruction? Remember anybody specifically in Acts? How about uh, Philip? An angel talked to him, the Holy Spirit talked to him. Hey, go down there and join yourself to that guy in that chariot. And Philip listened and he did what he was told and good things happened. Always listen to the Holy Spirit. You get an urge and you think, maybe that's the Holy Spirit. Well, give it some thought and follow through and see what happens. The Spirit's alive in us, is he not? So the Holy Spirit says, by the way, I'm not saying that just listen and you'll hear a voice. Hey, Marty. Take out the trash. That's probably what he'd tell me. But that's not what I'm saying. What's that? Yes. How do we know what to do? That's why we're here this morning. We take the God, word, word is God, word is with God. You know, I mean, it's so simple. It is. Well, it's a spiritual thing. 
And spiritual things are not impossible to understand, but they're, they're not as obvious. Because I, I, I keep coming back to this. I have a spirit. I know I have a spirit. What does my spirit look like? Does my spirit even look like anything? Is it possible for a spirit? Jesus said, God's a spirit, and the spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like we have. What part of my body does my spirit live in? Does it live in my body? Is it around my body? Is it even possible for that relationship to be there? And yet, when, what, how does James define death? James says, when the spirit leaves the body, then you're dead. So the body and the spirit somehow are, are connected. I, I don't understand any of that. So trying to understand God's Holy Spirit and how he communicates and works, unless God specifically tells me, I, I don't really know, but I do know he's working. I do know he's working. It's, I think we've talked about before when you, when you go out to your car and you put that key in the ignition and just, just that. There's a certain number of people in here that might understand how the tumblers in a lock and key situation work, but the rest of us don't. We just put our key in and we try, hey, it works. Some of us understand the mechanism in a steering wheel that will lock your steering wheel in a certain position. If you've turned the reels the wrong way and you're trying to get your key to turn in, it won't turn. Oh, my key won't, my car won't work. And they call the mechanic and the mechanic comes out and he turns your wheel about a quarter inch and there it is. Oh, I didn't know how that worked. And then you finally get your key turned all the way over and what happens? The engine fires up. How many of us understand completely the concept of internal combustion and valves and cams and how oil viscosity, all that stuff? No? Anybody else going to neglect to drive home today because you don't understand how a car works? We, we get the benefit of it, even if we don't understand it, and that's what we're seeing here, and that's what we're seeing in our own lives with the Spirit of God living in us. Harold? To me, it's a lot like, if, I really can't explain it, but the Scriptures promise to us that we'll have the gift of the Holy Spirit when we become Christians and we're baptized. And so I have to accept that. That's a promise given to me. It's just like we're promised if you pray to God and ask for help, he'll help you. There's things there for you that are promises that we can't really see nor explain, but the scriptures are clear about it. Exactly. God has promised he'll help us. He's given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help us. And I believe if we really put our confidence in what we've given the opportunity to know, we're so much better off when we're trying to live the Christian faith. That's my view. Absolutely. So there, there are these things that we can't see and, and we can't pull them out and explain them to anybody. Because you could do that with a car. You could take anybody out to a car and you had the proper tools and a place that's shady enough. Uh, you could disassemble a car and explain to anybody how everything works. And, oh, I see how that works now. But you can't do that with the Holy Spirit. We, we only have what God reveals to us. And here he's revealing the Spirit says... To the leaders of the church in Antioch, I want you to separate for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I've got for them. And what did the church do? They understood that. They separated them for that work. When the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip, Philip didn't go, well, I'm not sure exactly what you want me to do. No, he knew exactly what the Spirit wanted him to do. So the Spirit was speaking to people like that in those days. I don't believe the Spirit's working exactly like that now, but the Spirit is still with us and doing good through us, glorifying God through us, marking us as his. And even though we, remember when Paul wrote to the Philippian church and he said, pray to God, give thanks in everything, and the peace which passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you've experienced that peace after praying, you understand now what that means, but you don't know how it works. I pray, I have peace, and I don't know why. All I've done is talk to God about it. Why do I feel at peace? But that's what Paul said would happen. I go, okay, well, it works. It works. I put the key in, I turn, and it a car comes on, so I'm going to do that again and again and again because I need to go to Walmart, and I need to go to Dollar General, and I need to go to Bass Pro. I'm going to go places. And who cares if I don't understand how a car works? I know how to do this. So it's the same way with the Spirit of God. Use what you know. When you feel that release of that, all the worry 
after you become a Christian, uh, knowing that And we're about to read about a fellow who, who had an overbearing weight of sin. Uh, don't know how his case eventually turned out, but other people respond. P three, three, yeah, three, ship, ship. How many people on Pentecost <laughs> responded? 3,000. That's what I was trying to say, 3,000. Thank you for saying it. 3,000 people said, man, I'm convicted. I need to do something about this. So put the truth out there. And it can, it can do its work without you. So verse 3, they fasted and prayed. They laid their hands on them and sent them away. What's the significance of laying hands on these guys? This is a way of, of conferring authority. That's what it was for. You confer authority. When Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, don't lay hands suddenly on anybody, he says, well, if you're going to lay hands on somebody to confer authority, you better think this through, check them out. Make sure that they are proven individuals who are worthy of you conferring authority on them, and then you go ahead and lay hands on them and confer authority because you don't want to appoint somebody to an important place if they don't have everything they need to fulfill it, as far as you can tell anyway. So that's what they did. Verse 4 being sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. They went down to Seleucia. From there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, there they began to proclaim the word of God where? And why why'd they go to the synagogue? Absolutely. When Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he talked about the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? It's the power of God to salvation. To everyone who believes, and then he said, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. That is probably the main reason. Another reason would be this would have been a natural place for Paul to go as a Jew. Go to the synagogue. He'd be welcome. Hey, brother, Paul, or Saul, as he would have been known. Saul, the name Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was, was a Roman name. And so for whatever reason, he, he begins using the Roman name over the Jewish name, probably because uh, he's preaching to the world of Rome at large. But it doesn't say, just for some reason. And this is where it happens. He decides to go from Saul to Paul. So they're in the synagogue. And they had John as their helper, we're reminded by Luke. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician. Tell me about this magician. What nationality was he? He was Jewish. And he was not only a magician, Paul calls him a false prophet. So he's a Jewish guy. Don't miss that fact. He's supposed to be one of the people of God, but he's a false prophet. He's a sorcerer. He's a magician. Who was a magician we read about earlier? Simon, the sorcerer. Where was he? You remember? Boy, this is hard class. Back in Samaria. There we go. Chapter 8. 
So we've got another sorcerer. His name's Elamus. And Saul gently encourages him to turn to the truth. What does he say? Now, take note of verse 9. Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on Elamus, the false prophet, the Jewish sorcerer. And he says, you are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. <laughs> Man, he is laying it on thick. There is a time as a child of God, as a Christian in this world, to be nice. There is a time to be nice. There is also a time to be brutally honest. And this was obviously one of those times when the Holy Spirit says, you need to be brutally honest and I'm going to help you out with this. And so filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what Paul says, or Saul says, to, uh, to Elamus. By the way, what was the proconsul's name there in verse 7? Sergius Paulus. And tell me about him. If he's a proconsul, who's he serving? He's serving Rome. And it says of him... A man of intelligence. The Holy Spirit says to Luke, Luke, write down he was a man of intelligence. Oh, okay, we'll put that down. Sergius Paulus. So we've got this guy, the proconsul, a man of intelligence, and for whatever reason at this point, Paul decides to use the name Paul, the Roman name Paul. Maybe it's because... He, he just, you know, his name's Paul. Maybe I should start using the name Paul. Doesn't say. We're not told why he goes from using Saul to using Paul. But, but this is where it happens. Verse 11. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be... Was Paul familiar with blindness? Yeah, he was. When he was converted... On the road to Damascus, I think that's where his conversion take place. He wasn't baptized into Christ until three days later, but I think the man's mind was changed on the road to Damascus, and you probably agree with me. So he, he met Jesus, the risen Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah that he'd been waiting for for 1,500 years. He met him on the road to Damascus, and he was struck blind. And so now Paul is saying to this guy, going to be struck blind. How long? Just, just says for a time. So it's not permanent, it's not forever, but for a time you'll be blind. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. The Holy Spirit imposed upon him. He still has no time to go. Right. In blind, he's going to know. He's not going to be, and like you said, are you not going to stop perverting? Like you said, the Holy Spirit gave him a chance. He didn't put him to death. He, he, he gave him a chance to straighten out. And then, of course, he, he was blind for a while. Can you imagine what went through that guy's mind? Well, what, what nationality was he? He was Jewish. Actually, that doesn't tell us much about his nationality. He could have been from any nation, but, but he was Jewish. I don't think he was a proselyte. He was probably born Jewish. But he had chosen as a Jew to be a false prophet and a magician to deceive people. And so that's why the Holy Spirit had Saul, Paul, to dress him down the way he did. And as soon as the dressing down took place, the guy's blind for a time. And so he, he has to give some thought to what's going on. And then it says because of that, when, when Sergius Paulus saw that, the proconsul, what did he do? He believed. When you read through John's gospel, and you can, you can do this just this afternoon, pull out your, your, your gospel of John and just 
go through it and look for all the times that signs are mentioned in John's gospel. John is the apostle who tells us about the signs. And all of those signs are indicating, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, he's the son of God. Yes, he has authority. He's the one we've been waiting for. All of those signs show things about that. And so we read John's gospel and we see the signs. What does John say very near the end of his gospel? He says, there's a lot of other signs I could have put in this book. But there's, just, there's no room in the world for all the signs that Jesus did. But these are written for what purpose? That you might believe. That's why the Holy Spirit inspired John to put those signs in his gospel so that when people read that gospel, they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And, and how does John's gospel start? Do you remember chapter 1, verse 12? Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. But those who did receive him, to them he gave the right to do what? To become children of God. To those who did believe him, they were given the right to become sons of God. Wow. That's huge. That's huge. And so what does Sergius Paulus now have? He has the right to become a child of God. And so at this point, we read about the, the wonder of his conversion and his becoming a Christian. What do we read about here? Paul and his companions move on. So what? I, I want to hear what happened with Sergius Paulus. I want to hear what happened to Elymas. What, what's, no. Holy Spirit says, you don't need to know all that stuff. You just need to know what I told you just there. So move on. Oh, okay. Here we go. All right. I don't always see the sense in it. I remember I was back in high school. That was a long time in the group for, for me to remember. But I, I wasn't an athlete, but we had this thing. It was a fundraiser, and anybody who wanted to could, could, could be in this wrestling match. And so I was in the wrestling match. And, and uh, I, I happened to be in a position on, on top of this one guy, and I was trying to take him. I couldn't take him down. He was strong. And I had a friend who was a wrestler. His name was uh, Lovejoy, and he, Leonard Lovejoy, he'd say, Marty, grab his arm, pull it out, grab his arm. And I kept looking, like, that, that ain't going to do anything. And he kept, Marty, grab his arm and pull it out. And it didn't make any sense to me, but finally, because he kept telling me, I just, I'll do it, and I grabbed his arm, he went down. <laughs> Whoa, why didn't I listen to Leonard? Well, Leonard's just, he was just another high school kid in, in my class. and Listen to God. When God tells us stuff, listen. And when he doesn't tell you stuff, move on. That's, that's the smart thing to do when you know, okay, this is God. He's the one leading the way here. Let's just follow him. Don't you think that's a great idea? Jesus, the good shepherd, what do sheep do with a good shepherd? They follow him. He knows his sheep by name, and he calls them by name. So here we are, following the Lord. That's why we're here this morning. Verse 13. Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos, and they came to Perga and Pamphylia. But John did what? He left them. John Mark left them. Do you want to know why he left them? Too bad. <laughs> the Holy Spirit doesn't explain that to us. He just left. And then it says, verse 14, going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch. Pisidia is up in the area of present-day Turkey. So this is another Antioch, but it's not the one that sent him. Where was the Antioch that sent him? Syria, in Syria. That's where the church was in that city of Antioch, and that city was in Syria. So they're in Pisidian Antioch, and where do they go in Pisidian Antioch? The synagogue. Go to the synagogue and sit down. Found the, the visitor's pew, probably. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Wow. Now, that's the way they did it. They got visitors, but apparently they could see Saul was Jewish, 
and the brethren with him were sufficiently Jewish looking apparently that they didn't get upset about them being in their synagogue and so these guys come in and they, they invite them to speak. What have you got? Paul says, oh, y'all go ahead. We're just visiting. He stands up and he does his, his motioning with the hand thing that he did. He says, men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. And then he starts a sermon and that sermon goes right on down through Verse 41, and who do you think he's preaching about all that time? He's preaching about Jesus. Everything he says here is building up to Jesus. He gives them a rundown of their history. Who else gave a rundown of Jewish, Jewish history in a, in a sermon here in the book of Acts? Stephen did. He did a fantastic job. And I read that and I think, okay, the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to put that in there, but did the Holy Spirit inspire Stephen to say everything he said in that sermon? I don't know. That I don't know, but everything was accurate right down to the T. And Stephen ran down through their history. Why, why do you think he did that? When you hear the history of this country given accurately and in its context, does that help you? Yeah, even if it's not pleasant, it's helpful to know that truth. This is why we are where we are today. I like to watch programs like that. About, I watched one, this was a couple years ago, about the, I don't remember what the name of it, the captains of industry, and it was four, the four big guys who came over, and uh, Rockefeller and, oh, who else? And they, it was all about how shipping got started in this country and how the banking industry, the financial industry got started, how the iron industry got started, how the railroad got started. And it was fascinating to see, oh, okay, that's how it happened. And it happened through individual men who had the leadership, I believe God-given, to, to put things in place to, to create business. And all those businesses provided jobs and all those jobs made things happen. When you read the first verse of the Bible, what does it say? In the beginning, God created. And that's what we do when we use our gifts. We, we make something good happen. Y'all got anything growing in your garden? Yeah, you do. Who made that happen? Well, you say God did, but you, you helped him, didn't you? <laughs> See, I, that's the way it works. God says, here's some stuff. I want you to work. It, you ever buy, well, I was thinking the Tinker Toys. Nobody has, do they still make Tinker Toys? Legos. You buy Legos for your kid. What do you want them to do? Build stuff. When I was a kid, models were the big deal. Me and my buddy Kurt would go downtown. Madison had one street. It was, it was a single street, but they had three dime stores. And we would spend hours in the dime stores perusing over their models. Which one are you going to get, Kurt? Oh, I don't know. Don't get that Ravel one. Their pieces don't fit to get, get the, what's the name of that one? I don't know the brand names anymore. But, but we picked out models and we'd, we'd pull out the instructions and read them and separate the parts and trim off, build those things. It was a, a great thing to do. And why am I talking about that? I don't remember now. Yeah, yes building, creating. That's, that's what we do. And so Paul is reminding everybody about their history and, and everything that's supposed to bring them up to the point where the Messiah comes. And now he's telling them in this sermon, hey brothers, the Messiah has come. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. What more proof do you want? And that's his conclusion, which basically was Peter's conclusion in Acts chapter 2. He gets down to his conclusion in, in verse 30, 36. And what did Peter conclude in Acts 2.36? Jesus was Lord and Christ. And how did the people respond? They were pierced to the heart and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so that's the same basic sermon that Paul is preaching here. Verse 42. I, I don't mean to just not give you what he says in the sermon, but I want, I want to see what happens. Verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept 
Doing what? Begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Wow. Come back and tell us more about this. We're going to wait a week. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait a week. Come back on the next Sabbath. So when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. So the next Sabbath, in verse 44, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But what happens? Okay, this is where it all starts. All the persecution and the sad sad irony is that the persecution of the church and Paul's work all throughout the rest of Acts it's not the Romans it's, it's Jews who refuse to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and here's where it starts when the Jews saw the crowds were filled with jealousy began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming you remember the last big time the Jews were jealous? What happened? Jesus was crucified. And Pilate saw it. Pilate saw that the Jews didn't deliver Jesus up because he had done anything wrong. They saw that they were jealous, that they were losing power. That's why when it came right down to it, you remember what Pilate did? He washed his hands. So I'm not having anything to do with this. You know, I think about things like that. God didn't have to tell us that. He could have left that out, but he didn't leave it out. He put it in there. He told us how a heathen, pagan, selfish, Roman leader said, this isn't right. I don't want any part of it. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to let it happen to try to keep the peace, but it's not right. And so here the Jews saw the crowds and they were filled with jealousy. And they started contradicting the things spoken by Paul. And they were blaspheming. I don't know if that means they were blaspheming because they were talking bad about Jesus. Or if they were so angry, they were blaspheming the living God in the form of the Father. I, I don't know. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate this word. And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Now, wait a minute. What did he say about judging? Do you think in any of the minds of the Jews, they thought, hmm, I'm not worthy of eternal life. Do you think that's what happened? What, what is he communicating? What's the Holy Spirit having us think of when he has Luke write this down? Their actions was their judgment against themselves. It wasn't a mindset of judgment. It was simply that, look at your behavior. Your behavior judges you unworthy. And this is what you and I need to keep in mind. When you see someone doing something wrong or doing something right, you have to have a standard by which you judge that wrong or that right. Uh, simplest illustration is probably the speed limit. How far past the speed limit do you have to go? Say it's 45, because it's 45 everywhere around Choctaw. How far past 45 do you have to go to break the law? 46. Are, uh, what? <laughs> it, is that... Are, are you being judgmental if you say to someone who's doing 46, hey, brother, you're breaking the speed limit. Is that being judgmental? It's a matter of fact. You're not making a personal judgment. You're just observing what's happening. So the Holy Spirit's observing for us. These guys, by their behavior, are judging themselves. I just think that's an interesting point to, to consider. Verse 47, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. 
Paul says, since you've judged yourselves unworthy, we're going to go to the Gentiles. Look at verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. Woohoo! We're going to get the gospel preached to us. They glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. What does that mean, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believe? That's an interesting statement. As many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. I don't really know exactly what that means. I think about that. Is there a, a predisposition in the mind of God to say this one, you know, you'll be lost and you'll be saved? Or does it still come down to verse 46? Verse 46, I think, proves it's not simply about God making a choice. It's about us making choices. We judge ourselves worthy or unworthy by our behavior. And so when it says... believe had the right to become children of God. So therefore you're appointed a statement here saying you can become a child of God if you believe. And, and who, who makes the choice to believe? And see, that's, a, that's another kind of a mysterious thing too. I mean, we, we can make a conscious decision, but before you make the conscious decision, you already know where you are in your mind. What do you believe? And before you decide something, you already know what's the truth. But you have to decide, am I going to accept that or not? Am I going to agree with that or not? Am I going to let people know that I believe that? Because I don't want that or I do want that. And so that's the direction I'm going with this. We make a lot of decisions with our minds and our, our hearts and our spirits and they've all got to conform to what's right. Don? Debate somebody when they start talking about, because it does talk about predestination in Romans 8 and places. And it says things like this periodically through the New Testament. You're like, well, okay, you know what? And then they, Paul really gets really serious for almost a chapter. It seems like it's, it's a good, good paragraph. I forgot in Romans 8, I think, if I recall correctly. But, uh, it's, it's hard to debate them because, you know, when you sit there and read it, you're going, well, okay, I get this. But, but then, and there's not any verses that says, it's your choice, it's your choice. You right. know, there's not a law that says it's your choice, but constantly, it's your choice. <laughs> you're constantly preaching the gospel, and it's your choice to do it. And so the only way I know how to, you know, it's hard to debate and say, bada bing, bada boom, here it is. You know, it's hard to do that because... It's just in the narratives. It's obvious that we got to make a choice. You know, right. that it's, that it's our choice. But, so the only way I understand is, you know, God. God in the beginning knows who's going to choose Him, and so God, you know, the only way I know how to say it is, God chooses those who choose His Son. You know? mm -hmm. And so in the in the beginning, He, he does know who it's going to be, and I don't know how He decides from the beginning. Before you're even created, before the world was even created, if he, if he begins to help you already you know, right. from the very beginning, he already knows you're going to choose his son. So is he already helping you and not these other people? I don't know. You know, I don't know how that works. But from our perspective, he's got his perspective. We got our perspective. And our perspective is we need to choose. And it's not just a one-time choose. We choose all the time stuff. We choose stuff every day, you know, truth and not truth. And we're always making choices. Right. But, uh, anyway. but we don't always make the choice of what we know to be right. So, well, we got to quit. So thank you all for your participation. Appreciate you being here. Let's uh, prepare for worship.